Welcome to Dan's On Fandoms, I'm Dan. Hot damn, my butthole is still clenched after watching chapter 10. What an anxiety inducing episode. When that giant Krikna appeared, at least two drops of pee came out, but more on those spiders in a little. Let's jump into the episode, break it down, and discuss the top 8 baller moments in the Mandalorian season 2 episode, The Passenger. Starting us off at number 8, Din and the child are a tumbling. Those bastard thugs trying to capture the child deserve to roast. I'll fight a jabroni that tries hurting the child. I will say, the whole rope thing felt a little campy and cartoony to me, but can't harp on that too much as it wasn't that bad. Seeing the child go tumbling though, that warrants some serious street justice, and I was relieved to see that the child was unscathed and Din took care of business with those goons. I thoroughly enjoyed Din powering up his jetpack and sending that alien bounty hunter for a ride. These bounty hunters aren't guild members, as Din and Grief squashed their beef at the end of last season, so I'm assuming Moff Gideon has dispatched non-guild bounty hunters to find him and the child. I suspect we'll see some more thugs like this throughout the season. Din and the child then walk to Chalman's spaceport cantina in Moss Eisley, which brings us to our number 7 baller moment, Peli Mato and Dr. Mandibles playing Sabacc. I really enjoyed this scene. I love that Dr. Mandibles, the ant-like creature we've seen in chapter 5, is named Dr. Mandibles. What a name. As Din arrives at Chalman's spaceport cantina, my homegirl Peli is playing Sabacc with Dr. Mandibles. Din explains that he obtained Boba Fett's armor from a non-Mandalorian, and Peli tells him that Dr. Mandibles can connect Din to someone who can help him, but only if Din fronts him 500 credits for his bet against Peli, which he obliges. Peli then wins the hand with an Idiot's Array, which I just loved. Idiot's Array is a winning hand in Sabacc, which first appeared in the Legends novel Lando Calrissian and the Mine Harp of Sharu back on June 12, 1983. Aside from the great story development the show has provided thus far, it's these little details, easter eggs, tie-ins, and callbacks that I absolutely love about the Mandalorian. Favreau and company just continue to knock it out of the park. Continuing to our number 6 baller moment, the child salivating at the sight of that roasting crate dragon meat. The child was fantastic this episode, and seeing little man salivate over that crate meat was amazing. Our boy also loves eggs, but more on that in a little. I love that Pelly yells at the WED-15 Treadwell droid to not overcook that crate meat, telling him she likes her steak medium rare. Even though I'm a vegetarian, when I did eat meat, rare steaks are what's up. Pelly's tripping. Pelly then tells Din that a Mandalorian covert is close in the same sector as Tatooine. All Din has to do is pay Peli a finder's fee and transport the contact, known only as Frog Lady at this time, and her eggs at sublight to the estuary moon of Trask since hyperspace will kill the eggs. I'm thinking Frog Lady is the same species as the patron we see in a hat, smoking, during the cantina scene in A New Hope, which would be a great touch. Anyway, Din isn't happy about traveling at sublight speed since pirates and warlords roam the outer rim and would increase their chances of getting caught in a bad situation. Nevertheless, he agrees to provide transport for the Frog Lady, and the trio set off for Trask, bringing us to our number 5 baller moment of the episode, The Child and the Eggs. I can't lie, seeing the child check to make sure Din wasn't around, use the force to get to the eggs, and then begin to munch on the poor Frog Lady's eggs had me cracking up. I also love that Din and the child sleep together in that little nook, a father just taking care of his son. They're soon awoken, however, by an alarm that brings us to number 4, Dave Filoni, I mean Trapper Wolf, and Carson chasing down Mando. Trapper Wolf, played by Dave Filoni, gets his second appearance in The Mandalorian. He first appeared in the Season 1, Chapter 6 episode, The Prisoner. We learn that Trapper Wolf and Carson are patrolling and sweeping the Outer Rim for Imperial holdouts, which is why they've come across Din. Because the Razor Crest is pre-Empire Surplus, its transponder isn't emitting as he's previously not had to run a beacon. However, Carson tells Din that, now that this sector is under New Republic jurisdiction, he has to send them a ping to identify himself, which alerts them to the fact that he's wanted for helping bust out the Twi'lek, Quinn. I'm really glad we're seeing that Din's criminal actions last season do have consequences, even if much of the Outer Rim is like the Wild West at this point in the New Republic. I love that, before they tell Din he's wanted, Wolf and Carson open their S-foils, letting us know Din's in trouble. After Chapter 6, Danny and I both wondered if Din was going to be wanted by the New Republic, for breaking onto the New Republic correctional transport Bothan 5, and now we know he was. Din then makes a break for it, flying into the planet we all thought could be Hoth or Ilum, which appears at 
it's not. Din eventually cuts the engines, starts free-falling, and winds up in the canyon we saw from the trailers. Din's able to evade the duo of New Republic pilots, but the Razor Crest then falls through some ice and becomes heavily damaged. After Din comes to, we come to our number three baller moment. The frog lady's eggs are apparently tastier than chicken nuggos. Danny and I started shouting in shock when we saw the child slurp up an egg. Our boy just loves eating gross stuff. Din soon tells the frog lady that they'll have to wait until morning and they should try to get some sleep. However, frog lady is able to use the vocabulator from the remnants of Q90 to communicate with Din, telling him that her eggs are the last brood of her life cycle and that her husband has prepared for her arrival on the only planet that's hospitable to their species and that Din must abide to the terms of their agreement as well as the Mandalorian code and get them to Trask. This gets to Din, of course, and he begins making repairs on the Razor Crest. However, the child soon makes Din aware that the frog lady has wandered off and the two go searching for her, only to find her soaking it up in a hot spring in a cave. Can you blame the poor frog lady, to be honest? Who the hell wouldn't want to have a soak of the year in a hot spring during some trying times? I sure as hell could use a soak in a hot spring right about now. Din having to scold the child for trying to snatch one of those eggs had me cracking up. As Din is helping the frog lady out of the hot spring, things quickly go south once the child continues to munch on all things gross and eats a Krikna embryo, which takes us to number two. Oh hi Kriknas, haven't seen you since Adelon. The spider creatures we see in this episode are Kriknas. Their design is based off of concept art by Ralph McQuarrie of a Dagobah life form called the Nobby White Spider, which first appeared in Kevin J. Anderson's 1995 Star Star Wars Legends novel, Darksaber, as well as the illustrated Star Wars universe. In canon, Krikna's first appeared in the Star Wars Rebels Season 2 episode, Mystery of Chopper Base, on the planet Adelon. As soon as we saw those spider eggs, I said to Danny, we're about to see some goddamn Krikna's, and holy crap can director Peyton Reed create some tense ass scenes. As the spider situation unfolds, my anxiety was killing me. The two giant Krikna's chasing them was an ungodly sight. Imagine a creature like that chasing you down while its offspring are at your heels, no thank you. I yelled at my TV once the child was in the Razor Crest, run baby Yoda, get the hell out of there. As Din, Frog Lady, and the child make their way to the cockpit of the Razor Crest to escape the Krikna onslaught, my booty hole slightly unclenched as we come to our number one baller moment, Wolf and Carson let Din go. Coming through in the clutch, Wolf and Carson appear just in time to kill the giant Krikna who's about to peel open the Razor Crest like a can of sardines as Din is trying to take off. Once the Kriknas are taken Taking care of, Carson tells Din he has an arrest warrant for breaking out Quinn. However, security recordings show Din imprisoning Mayfeld, Gian, and Berg, as well as showing Din trying to help save Lieutenant Davin. Because of this, Carson and Wolf don't arrest Din, but also don't help him get off the planet, setting up the stage for next episode as Din is able to get the Razor Crest to just barely fly off world right before we see the child slurp up another egg. If you're not interested in hearing any spoilers, skip ahead now. With that said, Trask appears to be the watery moon we see the Razor Crest flying towards as well as the dock area Din appears to be on in the Season 2 trailer. This could be where Din might cross paths with our homegirl Sabine Wren. In the Season 2 trailer, we can see the frog lady with her egg backpack and a human female appears and is eyeing up Din. As Pelly mentions, the frog lady will be able to lead Din to a Mandalorian covert. Obviously, we'll have to wait and see if that's the case, but I'm starting to think there's a serious chance Sabine might appear this season, which I'm all for. Could Sabine be with a Mandalorian covert? Does she have knowledge of where to find one? I can't wait to see. While Chapter 10 wasn't as awesome as Chapter 9, this was still a really, really solid episode. As mentioned earlier, I thoroughly enjoyed the Easter eggs and callbacks we got this episode, and I'll always appreciate an appearance from my homie, Peli Mato. Additionally, using Ralph McQuarrie's concept art to design the Kricknas this episode was also a stellar touch. But what did you guys think about Chapter 10? How do you feel about the giant Kricknas? Let us know down in the comments. Want more Star Wars content? Check out some of our other videos. Please like and subscribe and stay nerdy.